Jesus is teaching a crowd and he's giving them a whole bunch of wisdom about God's character and how they can live together. In the midst of that, he says, why is it that you see the splinter that's in your sibling's eye, this little speck of sawdust, but you don't notice this big plank in your own eye? And how do you say to the sibling, oh, let me take that splinter out of your eye. Let me take that little speck of sawdust when all the time you've got this big plank in your own eye. And Jesus says, don't deceive yourself. Don't be a hypocrite. First, you take the log out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly to take that splinter, that little speck of sawdust out of your neighbor's eye. I wonder about hypocrisy. This notion of do as I say, don't do as I do, or having the best intentions to do the right thing, but then when push comes to shove or convenience gets in the way, we do the other thing instead. Hypocrisy isn't exclusive to people who are religious. It's for all people. We're all human and none of us are perfect. But I wonder what would happen if we decided we can be self-aware of our hypocrisy. And I wonder what would happen if we tried to work through it, recognize it in ourselves, and grow from it. God is with us in that. One time Jesus was in Jerusalem engaging some of the religious leaders of the day. And he'd done that before, but this time it was different. He outright said to them, you are hypocrites. You are so concerned with the tiniest little things and they just don't even really add up to good religion. You spend all of this time and energy seeking out one convert and when you do, you don't make their life better, you make their life worse. They're worse off for having tried your way. He calls them blind guides and he says, you can do better. The way you're doing this, you can do this better. When I was younger, I was a person filled with a lot of doubt. Doubt about God, doubt about religion, doubt about some Christians I was meeting. I still have doubt from time to time, and I don't think there's anything wrong with doubt. In fact, I don't regret that part of my life. This is part of my journey. One time in that season of doubt in my life, there was a person in my life who was a person of faith and they encouraged me in my faith. Sometimes in really generous ways, sometimes a little pushy. But they really wanted me to explore faith for myself and they sometimes said that they wanted me to have a spiritual experience. One day I learned that a friend of mine was facing a real personal tragedy. And that was hard. And there was nothing I could do. And that was really hard to admit as well. And before I knew it, one evening I found myself outside and praying. And I prayed to God. I said, I need a sign. I need a sign to know that everything is going to be okay. Now, I don't know that that's a prayer that I would pray now, but it's what I prayed that night. And in the darkness, I saw out there a light. And I thought, that's the sign. That's a sign from God. Everything's going to be okay. I was closed off to God a long time, but in my heart, in that moment, I was open. And it was a spiritual experience. But then I watched that light become two lights as the person who was behind the wheel of the car off in the distance turned their vehicle around a corner. And I laughed. And I still realized, no, I was open. I was open to God speaking to me. I was open to interpreting something special. 
So I went back to that person in my life who's a person of faith, and I told them everything. I told them the whole story. And they laughed in my face. And my season of doubt continued. We don't always get it right when it comes to how we engage other people about faith. And sometimes I wonder what would have happened if that person, instead of laughing in my face, had heard my story and said to me, tell me more. Jesus is saying we have to really mind ourselves if we're being so rigid on how we practice our faith that we lose focus on why we practice our faith. Likewise, if we only encourage people in our, their faith one way, we might end up discouraging them in another. How we encourage people really matters because the ways in which we discourage people, that matters too. Jesus tells a parable, a story with a lesson in it. And this one's about a man who owns a vineyard and he has two sons. He asks the first son, will you go into the vineyard and do a day's work? And the son says, no, I will not go. But then he ends up going anyway. Then the man asks the second son, will you go into the vineyard and do a day's work? And that son says, yes, I'll go. But then he never does. And then Jesus asks the crowd listening to this parable, which of these two did the will of their parent? And the crowd says, the one who actually went and did the work. And Jesus says, you got it. So go and do likewise. When I was in my early 20s, and I knew everything, I was working on a project with some friends, and it was going really well. One of the people working on the project was in their late teens. And I was frustrated by some of their choices. Sometimes they would take on a responsibility but not follow through. Or if we were going to say, hey, who can step up for this or that? They weren't going to raise their hand. That was frustrating. And after a while, I decided, okay, I guess they're just an unreliable person. A few years later, I'm in my late 20s, and I'm still pretty sure I know everything. And there's some other projects coming up, and I want to be a part of them but no one's inviting me and I'm frustrated because I want to help. And eventually I talk to somebody involved in some of the projects and they say, you know, there are folks who, when they think about you, they think about who you were in your early twenties. And, you know, sometimes you were frustrating and uh, they don't want to work with you on a project now. And I remember being really frustrated by that, thinking, well, but I've grown. I've grown since then. I, I made a lot of mistakes back then, but I've grown and I've learned from them. And it's not okay to judge me on the person I used to be. Judge me on the person I am now. A few years later, I'm in my early 30s, and I'm starting to have a sneaking suspicion that I don't know everything. And I'm at an event with some friends, some friends from that first project. And here comes that person who was in their late teens during that project. And I say, hello, and we have a cordial talk, catching up on life, how are you, how are you? And, and afterward, they leave, and I'm standing there with a friend who had been on that project. And I say something about how, that's too bad that they were so unreliable. And they say, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, just an unreliable person. And they said, you know, you know that project was like 10 years ago, right? And I said, well, yeah. And they said, don't you think they've done some growth since then? Don't you think you owe them the possibility that they shouldn't be judged on the person they were, that maybe they've grown into the person they are now? And I realized I had done to them 
exactly what other people had done to me. And I didn't feel good when it was done to me. So maybe I need to change the way that I think about other people and allow for growth. Because if I want people to see the growth in me, I need to be open to the growth in them. The work that we do on ourselves, it matters. And the way that we're patient with each other matters. Growth matters. It's like those two sons. There's that son who says, I'm not gonna go work in the vineyard, but then later he does it anyway. Even if we're working on our growth later, that's working on our growth. The way that we encourage each other in our faith, that matters. Whether they have it right away or they come to it later, the way that we encourage, the way that we allow for growth, it's a reminder for our own growth, the way that we want others to give us grace as well. Maybe that's the key to reminding ourselves that we are all on the journey. At the end of the Gospel of John, there's this moment of reconciliation between Simon Peter and Jesus on the beach. Peter has denied Jesus three times when he was arrested. And then later, after he's crucified and is resurrected, Jesus appears to the disciples and they have breakfast on the beach. And then Jesus asked Simon Peter three times, do you love me? And Simon Peter says, yes, I love you. And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. Do something with that love. It's three denials undone by three declarations of love. Afterward, Simon Peter and Jesus, they're walking along the beach and Simon Peter turns and he sees another disciple following behind them. And he says to Jesus, what about him? And Jesus says, what about him? If all these other things are going to happen to him, what is that to you? You follow me. When I was in seminary taking classes to be a pastor, I sometimes found myself frustrated. To me, an academic setting is where you go to learn something new. Every once in a while, one of my student peers would take it as an opportunity to showcase what they already knew to be true, or to be excited when they could confirm what they're being taught is what they already knew to be true, or to express their frustration if what they're being taught didn't already confirm what they knew. That didn't happen often, but when it did, I'd get frustrated by that. Sometimes those students seemed to goof off a bit in class or had some comments about it afterward. And I thought, wow, you're going to be a pastor? A little later, one semester, I was reading my Bible and I came across this passage at the end of the Gospel of John, where Simon Peter and Jesus reconcile. And there's that moment where Simon Peter sees the disciple down the path and he says to Jesus, what about him? And Jesus says, what about him? You follow me. I realized when it came to those other students and whether or not they were taking academics seriously the way I wanted them to, that's not up to me. And I'm not on their ordination committee. I'm not their professor. I'm not their future church. And I'm not them. All I have to do is be concerned about my own path, worry about my own academics. And what I was doing with my judgment was giving someone else the opportunity to think the same things about me. Jesus says, what about them? You follow me. And reading that passage has changed how I try to approach life when it comes to how I see others doing their path so that I can focus better on how I do mine. After that moment of reconciliation, Peter still needs grace. And that's the thing, we all still need grace. We have moments where we do better or we grow, and yet we still need grace on the journey. For Simon Peter, he was concerned about someone else's path. 
but I wonder what would happen if he focused on his own. We all have a journey to take with Jesus. What would happen if we focused on the following rather than focused on how someone else is doing it? I wonder about hypocrisy. I wonder about why we felt compelled to call out others, but we're not so comfortable about others calling us out or calling out ourselves. I think about that teaching Jesus had about noticing the speck of sawdust in your neighbor's eye when you have this great plank in your own. And I wonder if sometimes what we need is the ability not just to see the plank in our eye and deal with it, but maybe ask someone for help with this plank. I wonder what happens if we open ourselves to God teaching us about how to model faith in action to others. And I wonder about what would happen if we were open to God revealing to us the power of our growth. And I wonder about what would happen if we were open to God reminding us that we have to be concerned about our own path, our own journey in faith. I wonder what would happen.